I'll give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. We, <clears throat> we wish to thank you, Mr. President, and the Chinese presidency for having organized today's discussion on strengthening the principles of multilateralism. The theme that has been proposed is highly relevant. It enables us to critically take stock of the state of international relations and, this, and to discuss ways to surmount the systemic problems that have amal, amassed therein. We thank the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, for his assessments. We thank the President of uh, ECOSAC, Miranda King, the President, uh, Representative of President of the General Assembly, Madam Altani, and uh, Judge Abdul Kawi Ahmed Yusuf for their briefings. The present day world is uh, undergoing a period of profound shifts which are leading to the creation of a polycentric international system. Thanks to global activation of uh, trans border economic ties and expedited scientific and technological progress, new centers of economic growth and political influence are gaining traction. These centers uh, claim uh, are, are looking to more broadly participate in international affairs, are striving to carry out independent to domestic and foreign policies that reflect their national interests, and to opt for development models which reflect their national, cultural, and religious identities. Such trends will only gain ground. Under such circumstances, the significance has risen of mechanisms for multilateral diplomacy, for concerted quests for responses to shared threats and challenges, for ensuring collective leadership. The role has risen of the United Nations and its Security Council as the central organ for international policy, as has that of such flexible formats for global governance as, for example, the G20. There is more weight behind regional and inter-regional inter and uh, inter-regional associations. And at the same time, the aspiration of, of, the most, uh, of most states to, to strengthen polycentric pillars of the uh, global order is encountering attempts by some uh, players to maintain their global dominance to gain unilateral advantages. They are brazenly uh, circumventing the, UN, the United Nations and its Security Council and are adopting a selective approach towards fulfillment of their international legal obligations. They are announcing themselves to be multilateral claim to be multilateral, and those who do not concur with their policies and methods are labeled revisionists and opponents of multilateralism. So multilateralism is acknowledged by them only on the basis of their conditions. One need not look far for examples by themselves of breaches of multilateralism. There are attacks against the core principles of Middle East settlement attacks against the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action on the Iranian nuclear program, attacks against the obligations under the World Trade Organization and, multi and the Multilateral Climate Agreement, which are key for strategic stability, including disarmament agreements. And that list goes on. As a result of such actions, international law is being eroded, law on the basis of which the post-war world order is based. There are statements trumpeted which not only cast doubt on the legal force of international treaties, but also which prioritize parochial, unilateral approaches, inter alia, uh, placed above those decisions taken by the United Nations. Within the halls of the United Nations, we have already drawn attention to the fact that the primacy of international law in global affairs is something which Western colleagues are relentlessly attempting to supplant with some kind of a rules-based order. And they themselves have engineered those roles on the basis of political expediency. And uh, this uh, constitutes a flagrant example of double standards. Such an approach has been leveraged for imposing sanctions against inconvenient states, for announcement of trade wars, uh, for stoking tensions in international relations. At the same time, the reasons behind such measures are increasingly far-fetched, either imagined intervention in elections or unsubstantiated accusations of chemical weapons use and other sins. Today, it is believed that in order to uh, uh, leverage accusations against anybody, it suffices to add the words highly likely. Evidence is not necessary. 
the views of the accused are of no interest to those who are making the accusation. Uh, such tri uh, such uh, tricks and methods are nothing new, but today they have been brought to the forefront. But we recall well how many times false pretexts were used to uh, justify interventions and the unleashing of wars. It suffices to recall the bombing of Yugoslavia in 1999, the occupation of Iraq in 2003 with blatantly fallacious pretexts, uh, the consequences of which continue to weigh heavily on the peoples of that country, the crude manipulation of the Security Council mandate in Libya in 2011, which unleashed ruinous and protracted chaos. The same methods were harnessed and continued to be harnessed today against Syria. These unilateral acts of force have plunged the Middle East and North Africa into chaos, have sown the seeds for rampant extremism and terrorism. There are alarming attempts to drag certain countries into military alliances contrary to the will of their peoples, whereas other states have threats brandished of punishment for the free choice of their partners and allies. In the Balkans specifically, states in the region with pledges of imminent uh, happiness are being insistently dragged into NATO with incantations about inadmissibility of intervention in their domestic affairs. And they themselves are intervening inexcusably in others' affairs. Such alliance-based mindsets merely generate additional threats to international security. They are catastrophic for the principles of multilateralism. We observe the space being narrowed for constructive international cooperation. Confrontation is being fueled. Uh, overall, unpredictability is gaining ground. Nuclear doctrines are being revised. And the threshold for acceptability for nuclear weapons use has been lowered. Uh, the, there is a significantly heightened risk of unforeseen conflict being triggered. And of course, all of this is reflected on the activities of the United Nations uh, these days. We are commemorating the 100th anniversary of the First World War. This was a strange war. It began as if on its own, and its protagonists and participants were not even able to consider, to imagine the horrific uh, consequences that would follow and the fact that the First World War would spawn an even greater disaster, the Second World War. Today, the situation is such that it compels us to look with caution at these historical lessons and to hope that uh, such scenarios of reckless, unbridled, uh, spiraling uh, confrontation will not recur. Following the Second World War, we s established the United Nations. And in the charter of our organization, for the first time in history, principles were enshrined of multilateralism, the establishment of a viable mechanism for global governance through harmonizing states' positions. Key elements were set out for a polycentric world order, and the core principles and norms of international relations were enshrined, spanning from sovereign equality of states and prohibition on intervention in their domestic affairs to prohibition of the use of force in international relations without the sanction of the Security Council or beyond the framework of self-defense. We also wish to recall the fact that the use of sanctions mechanisms pursuant to the Charter of the United Nations is the exclusive prerogative of the Security Council. Unilateral restrictions, attempts to extraterritorially apply national legislation are illegitimate, and they only heighten confrontation in international affairs, and they make it all the more difficult to, in a concerted way, seek solutions to problems that arise. Furthermore, practice has shown so not only are these measures are illegitimate, but they are also ineffective. In order to avoid uh, further difficulties in the situation globally, it is important to full uphold international law. Law, specifically, not certain rules, including the Charter of the United Nations, uh, state sovereignty, and respect for cultural and, and civilizational specificities of one another. It is important to strive towards cooperation, not confrontation. All parties need to acknowledge that peoples enjoy the right to independently determine their future without meddling from abroad in their domestic affairs. Uh, uh, positive results are only achieved when states pool their efforts for the advancement of mutually beneficial and mutually respectful cooperation. 
Only this approach will ensure dividends for all members of the international community and fair, democratic, and harmonious world order. We trust that today's debate will be a meaningful discussion about the role of the United Nations, a critical key mechanism for the resolution of modern, for governing modern international relations. Thank you, sir. I thank the representative.